Adam, nice to meet you and mm. welcome here. Thank you and nice to meet you too, Robson. Uh, <laughs> we are here uh, for actually two things. This is going to be the first video of the Sovereign University, so our online uh, e-learning platform. Okay. And we are also here for Kuba Plus, mm -hmm. uh, trying to form Lightning Dev in El Salvador. So it's mm -hmm. a, a great opportunity for the youth uh, yeah. because education um, is key, right? Absolutely. I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about education generally, uh, about Bitcoin and uh, to some extent about El Salvador as well. So it's a perfect combination for me. So you're pretty famous in the Bitcoin world, I have to say. I don't know about that, but yeah, <laughs> okay. I know maybe you don't like that. <laughs> maybe for the audience that wouldn't know you, yeah. could you explain a bit your background and um, mm -hmm. what are you known for? Sure. So um, without, I mean, being one of the older people involved in Bitcoin, I could give you a very long talk about my life, but I'll try to keep the, the short version. Um, so my background, I mean, in terms of education myself, I was educated in mathematics and physics, and that's, so I'm sort of interested in technical stuff and engineering. I did like nuclear engineering for a while, believe it or not, as well as software engineering. And I also did quite a bit of teaching, like things like mathematics and physics, especially mathematics. And as you probably can appreciate, that's like one of my main loves is mathematics. Um, so that was all there to some extent before I heard of Bitcoin and I heard of Bitcoin around, you know, 2012 time, that kind of time frame via various media outlets. I mean, you know, you heard about the Silk Road and everyone was like, well, what exactly is this stuff, you know? And so, um, although the interesting point is that I wasn't particularly interested in cryptography before Bitcoin. I mean, I'd certainly read a couple of books like popular science type books about, you know, what is a, what is RSA and I'd, and I kind of peripherally, I'd heard about, you know, these, they called them the crypto wars in the 90s. And, you, you know, you'd see things like, oh, you, you have some old Windows 95 PC and you're looking, what is this 40-bit encryption protected by, uh, you know, export control? And, you know, it, it was very weird. But like most people, I'd, I never really paid that much attention to it. But something, of course, was changing. And I, I was very aware of it in the early 2000s, which was the advent of peer-to-peer -peer technology. You know, you had things like torrenting. That became a huge deal. And um, I even remember trying out Tor when I was living in China in the early 2000s and it didn't work at all. <laughs> but it was kind of interesting because there was that whole thing of like, oh, there are, there are these new technologies that are somewhat subverting political structures. And I didn't really fully like connect it in my head yet. But once Bitcoin came around and you saw things like drug markets and you saw things, how this new kind of public key encryption technology was changing things. And I was like, oh, this is, this is a real new thing in the world. And Bitcoin was like the, the crystallization of that for me as it was for many other people. Because although at first I thought it was just a kind of a weird thing, you know, which kind of is weird. <laughs> um, uh, once I'd actually looked at the white paper and having enough of a technical background, not, not the exactly the right technical background, not distributed systems, for example, but having a lot of technical background, I could appreciate from reading it in outline that this wasn't just some weird thing, but was a very new thing in the world. Especially the whole idea of proof of work slash hash cash. And I hadn't seen that at all before. And it really sort of turned on a light bulb in my brain like a lot of people back in those days. Um, sorry, sorry, no. interrupt if you want. No, I don't no, no, it's good. I think it was very like back in the day, yeah, because yeah. You've, you've been into Bitcoin for more than 10 years now. Just a little more than 10 years now, yeah. It was something, I mean, like I say, you can never, some people maybe they can define it in one day, oh, you know, yeah, suddenly. Discovered Bitcoin. Discovered Bitcoin. Bitcoin. But uh, for me, it was, it was a very slow process of just like discovering in news articles and thinking that's interesting, but not very interesting. And then, you know, and then eventually, like I say, for me, the, the, the turning point was, I guess, the beginning of 2013 when I actually read the white paper. And it isn't an easy document to read. I mean, the thing about that document, and I still, if you're a new person in, in Bitcoin today, don't, don't dismiss it because it's old or something, right? You should at least read the abstract, which is a very, very well concise, argued thing about why a different form of money based on this idea makes sense. And then, of course, after that, and I think this is what puts a lot of people off, it starts to get into these diagrams of hashes and blocks and, and weird stuff and it it isn't particularly clear but if you can per persevere with it it is a document worth reading uh, especially if you have any technical background if you don't then just read the abstract and that's enough you know that gives you the idea oh you really need to get an mm. idea of what that type of change yeah and then the you can move to these other like nowadays we have much better resources mastering bitcoin and all kinds of other yeah, yeah. and so how would you say that actually like the industry has evolved for 10 years is a long period you're saying now we have like a lot of books a lot of education yeah Google plus have you really seen like um, when you discovered Bitcoin, did you realize it would grow to be this enormous <laughs> industry where you actually like move countries, move to another country because of it? I mean, it might surprise some people because 
maybe it wouldn't, I don't know, but, but back in those days, a lot of the people involved in Bitcoin were dreamers, you know, I think it's fair to say. Some of them were just out and out crazy. Some of them were scammers, and that's still true today. <laughs> but um, well, I think one thing that a lot of them had in common was they were kind of big dreamers, you know, it wasn't necessarily very realistic. People were talking about all kinds of crazy things about countries adopting Bitcoin, you know, which seemed so ridiculous back then. <laughs> and here we are, right? Here we are in, in, in San Salvador. Um, but yeah, I remember one thread on Bitcoin talk, like, which will be the first country to adopt Bitcoin? And I was thinking, hmm, maybe Iceland, because, you know, they've got this uh, heat energy, you know, the geothermal energy. And like, of course, it wasn't Iceland at all. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, well, where, 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 I don't know where we were yeah, going no, with that. No, I can't it's remember. Like, well, it's actually crazy that yeah. uh, the discussion of a country adopting Bitcoin yeah. was already back then, because it was inevitable. Like, like you said, mm. we're dreamers, and you, you sort of did. I think people were sense. dreamers. Some people thought, this is just inevitable. You know, it's definitely going to win. Other people, and I think I was in the more, probably more middle camp of like, look, there are solid reasons to think this is an experiment that will eventually work. But we've got to be realistic, you know, it's software. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong. There's all kinds of political economic things we're not going to be able to predict. We just didn't know. I mean, I, if anything, I think a lot of people were too pes pessimistic. Like, I remember thinking that, oh, the governments are going to come after us next year. And this was in 2013, you know, and it was like, well, they, they kind of did come after us in a way, but it, they just think these things move so slowly. I mean, any, any big, like, geopolitical or political thing, it just moves slowly. And so... You know, we're still having a lot of the same debates today as we were having then. You, I'll give you a good example. The Winklevoss twins came out with an ETF proposal at the end of 2013. <laughs> and I remember vividly being on a Reddit thread discussing like, oh my God, isn't it great there's going to be an ETF? And first there's the question of, is it great or isn't it great to have an ETF? And the second question is, is it ever going to happen? I was just laughing. I was saying, you guys are idiots. There is no way we're going to have an ETF in the next five years. So at least on that prediction, right. I was dead right. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, like you said, like the debate all of you, uh, mm. so I, did, I wasn't in Bitcoin back then, mm. I was way too young, but the, mm. all the debates you had, they are, they are happening right now again and again and again. A lot of things are just repeat. Obviously, some things are new here and there. You know, the whole, the block size war thing that, that took many years to resolve, it, it was just only the tiniest hint of it back then. And it re only really started to take off like, I don't know, end of 2015 or 2016, you know. So some things we just didn't see coming, but a lot of things we just have the same debates over and over again, you know. And another big debate in, it wasn't, that's the thing, it wasn't really a debate in 2013. Well, a lot of people wanted to see, they'd go to their local bar and they say, accept Bitcoin for, to buy a beer and here's a QR code and they take video, they'd get so excited if they could achieve one example of like paying for something with Bitcoin and they, look, look, here's a video with a QR code. And there was one bar in New York, I remember, maybe it was Charlie Shrem's bar. Everyone was so excited, and I remember saying at the time, and being the kind of uh, the boring guy saying, "No, look, this isn't very realistic. Look, this is not a consumer. It doesn't work as a consumer payments technology." So that's something that has changed because while we still have that same enthusiasm, for, especially from new entrants, they want to get it used as a currency. Now we have a path where that's actually realistic, you know, with Lightning, and we see it here. We, we've all anyone who's been here any time has been to bars and hotels and events and meetups, and we know we can actually use um, Bitcoin as a currency now. Yeah, so actually, speaking of Lightning, yeah. uh, you've seen it from non-existent. Yeah. Like Satoshi's saying, there were poss possibilities yeah. to get like... Sequence numbers, and yeah, end sequence, yeah. Exactly. And up to... How did you see the whole process from the first white paper that came out, I guess, yeah. you read it and when it got yeah, out, yeah, all yeah. the way to being now a reality? I mean, uh, one, one slightly unfortunate thing is I don't really think that that white paper was nearly well as written because <laughs> it's a very it strange paper. Hard to read very hard to read, very long and very hard to read. And um, however, to be fair, if you persisted in really like reading it, and to be honest, I kind of skim read it at first and I heard some other people talking about it. I wasn't paying that much attention, but the concept was clearly very important. It was just a question of whether this was the right implementation. But don't forget, like for example, Christian Decker had a, a very similar concept he wrote in a paper uh, there was there was like they actually almost tried to publish at the same time and his his idea was slightly different um, but this one won out um, I found it very difficult to understand and I was in like the majority there for sure even amongst technical people to exactly how is this going because part of it was the original white paper proposed ideas that involved things that weren't yet available they were even I, f I might be wrong about this but I think they proposed a, a, a new opcode but more importantly, of course, the basic principle was that as it stood, we couldn't really implement it right then and there. And I'm getting, might be getting this wrong, but I think it was January 2015. I sometimes forget exactly which year they published that paper. But whichever year it was at that particular point, we couldn't really do it because we didn't have SegWit. Exactly. So the concept for anyone who, who just doesn't want to get into the deep details of SegWit here is that 
if a transaction is malleable, that is to say somebody broadcasts it, but then you could, it can, the transaction ID can change. That, that kind of screws up how Lightning works. And SegWit was, ended up being like the way, and it is probably just the correct way that we fix that problem. So it was only after SegWit that Lightning really started to get, get the kind of rocket ship of actually this is going to be a thing now. And people, are, people were trying to build, well, they were building it before SegWit was activated. And as you probably know, there was a huge firestorm around that. Yeah, exactly. So Lightning and, Se and Segwit and the block size walls, they're all kind of mixed up in this big bundle. And we had the bull run at the same time. So and the well, yeah, the bull, the bull run towards... Even. The weird thing is the bull run came, the really big like growth in price came towards the end of that period when everything looked the worst. Because honestly, there was serious worry that the whole experiment was going to collapse, but through, through forking into two, two camps, you know. So the weird thing is, for some reason, that coincided with the most success in price. So I don't know why. Who, who, who was leaving the, the big block wall? Because mm. uh, you saw it from the beginning. Yeah. You changed your mind in the middle while well, you were always on one yeah, side. That's a fair question, who, who yeah. Was, like, I, I, was, I want to say that I was very open-minded at the start about it. Um, there were a lot of debates, like let's say more sober debates in the early days on the Bitcoin dev mailing list. And I tried to keep up with some of them. But it was contentious. Even there, there were people actually getting quite angry with each other. And then that was early on. Um, and then they had these kind of series of uh, conferences, these scaling Bitcoin conferences. The first one, I think, was in Canada. There were, there were like four or five of them. I only attended the third one in Italy in 2016. And then there was another one in Hong Kong. Uh, the, the Hong Kong was before that. It was, I think it was Canada and then Hong Kong. And then there was the Italy one. And then there was uh, Stanford. But by the time it had reached Stanford, everything was, that was round about the time SegWit activated and things had kind of changed, you know. But yeah, they, I didn't go to those first two early ones. And I think they were the important ones because I think it was the Hong Kong one in which SegWit actually got announced. And that's, I think that's the point at which I split off and said, oh, it's clear I want to be on one side of this debate. And, and the reason was because the way SegWit was proposed, essentially it functioned as um, not only as a solution to a what's kind of a design bug in Bitcoin, the fact that transaction IDs can be malleable. But it also had this property, and it's debatable whether it should have had this property, that it, by almost like by the back door, actually did increase the block size. It increased the potential throughput of how many transactions per second we can get in Bitcoin. And I think um, whether that was the right or, or wrong decision, the effect should have been that it should have brought the community together because it actually did create an effect where there was going to be a significant increase in um, in throughput, but people had entrenched and there were business interests and it was all a complicated story in the back. By the way, if people are interested in this, I strongly recommend Jonathan Beer's book, The Block Size Wars. Yeah. It's not a very long book, uh, and so it's, pre it's a pretty easy read. And it really goes, I mean, he was, I, mean, I, I met Johnny in a couple of these conferences and I was, you know, I, I know the guy and he, he really was on the ground floor with every single one of these events. He knows everything that happened. And it's a really interesting book to read. Think of it like a, a kind of journalist's account. He's not really a journalist, but that's basically kind of what it is. So I'd recommend that. Um, it's yeah. And it's crazy how SegWit literally shaped the way of Bitcoin for the, all the foreseeable future, because mm. even now we stamp ordinals, all of those uh, yeah. consequences of SegWit. There's, there's a consequence um, there, although that's, that was a kind of an unintended consequence, exactly. but, so <laughs> but yeah. To say how difficult it is to take any fork or change in the, in the Bitcoin protocol. Right, and, and to foresee the consequences as, as, as you're explaining, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, SegWit was a big deal, but I think it was very important and it was well reasoned in my opinion and it was a soft fork and it was a block size increase, but that was kind of like, and I think probably my way of thinking there, it's certainly not unique, that that was the reasonable path forwards. And it was probably perceived as such by, by a lot of the big and important players. And that's why behind the scenes, even though on the surface, all the big guys with all the big names had all gone on, on the Segwit 2X bandwagon. Uh, I think that's probably why they didn't win. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. We were all terrified. <laughs> Looking at today, what mm. would be like the big next change you would want to see in the, in the protocol? Because mm. there's a lot of debate between uh, yeah. which BIP should be implemented. Do you mm. have like a preference mm. uh, on, on one of those? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to come down on the side of one particular bit, because I, partly because I don't spend enough time reviewing. And you have to be serious about these things. But I would say that there's somewhat of a trend that I think is inevitable towards creating some kind of um, functionality that makes second layer 
let's say, a more complex second layer financial transacting more effective. Mm -hmm. So at the moment we have Lightning, we're going to get, because of Taproot, we're going to get a slightly better, well, maybe a lot better version of Lightning, although it might take a while, unfortunately. We're using PTLC, so if people don't know PTLC's point, time lock contracts just make certain things, let's say, more private, more efficient, more effective on, on the Lightning layer. So that would be a good step forward. But I think we're going to find that we want, whether it's like another layer on top of Lightning or an alternative second layer or just something that we can't even imagine, if we can make the scripting language slightly more expressive, and I, 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 I probably, probably some people are already sensing that I'm hinting towards covenants yeah, as a general concept here, but it doesn't have, it might, I, don't, I, I don't want to limit it because I feel like there might be something, because zero knowledge proofs are another big story here, and, 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 and there's, how do we make something, I mean, people talk about roll-ups, people talk about all kinds of different models of how we can build second layers, but there's, what I would love to see is somebody could make an argument that says, for example, oh, here's this covenant opcode, and just with that, you could do any kind of, they could explain that you could get whatever you want. If you want to build your ordinals or your, or your, or your smart contracts or your whatever, off the chain, because the problem is fundamentally getting things like privacy, getting things like smart contracts on the blockchain is always a trade-off that most Bitcoiners, I think, rightly, are not ever going to accept. So we had a long debate, I mean, we didn't mention this, about confidential transactions back in, from 2015 through 2018, so it was kind of in parallel with the block size thing. And it has trade-offs, you know, I mean, the obvious trade-off at the time was, well, that means those outputs are going to be really big and that's going to use too much chain space. And then there was a debate about, well, yeah, that's also, like I was showing today in the session, you remember, I was saying, look, we can audit how many coins there are on the blockchain. We can all do it on our Bitcoin. No. And yet we can do that with confidential transactions, but there's like a layer of indirection there, which some people are not very comfortable with because there's an assumption of some cryptographic thing. I mean, it's a very debatable point. Anyone who wants to tell me I'm wrong, I'm absolutely fine with that. But I think the general sense you get from the community is making changes which add any kind of, which add complexity or which add like a level of indirection to, to, to this very sort of pure, simple thing that Bitcoin is, is something that most people are trying to avoid. But yet there is also a demand for functionality, even if it's just something like I want to be able to to make um, what is it uh, a, 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 what they call a vault, but some kind of method for inheritance that is actually effective instead of ineffective, right? If, instead of being incredibly complicated, uh, or if it's something more advanced like a smart contract thing, or a, I don't know what it is exactly. What, whatever you want. Yeah, sure. Um, for the people that know the, the Sovereign University, we talk a lot about uh, Liana and the Miniscript uh, solution oh, okay. with like uh, time stuff. Liana, yeah, the, the, and, that's a more. That's, Liana is like a complex, somewhat complex vaulting system exactly. with a user interface Covenant, for it. Because with Covenant, you can do so much. With more Covenant, that it's going to work better. Yeah, 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 yeah uh, for sure. It's actually funny because when we think of like Bitcoin implementation and changes, we have the one that uh, are being approved by the consensus and the one being implemented by the hardware wallet. And even for Miniscript or Taproot, uh. we also took a lot of time for the industry to actually use the changes made by Bitcoin. So we even see like the mm. ricochet effect on the time it needs for mm. everyone to get up to pace with the, the, the changes. So there's really like yeah. this layer of idea, discussion, implementation, and then real life uh, usage. So yeah, and it does seem that quite unsurprisingly that process slows down over time as the ecosystem gets bigger. And we don't want to yeah. break it. And we don't want to break it. And it's, yeah, we're more cautious, but also like, as you say, this whole spreading out effect, like Taproot exists, not many people are using it. I personally think that a big factor in that is Taproot doesn't have an economic advantage, whereas Segwit did. So there's that factor as well. Yeah. You were talking about uh, privacy. Um, mm -hmm. You are the creator, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, uh, Chris Belcher, uh, you're talking about Join Market. Oh, Chris Belcher is the creator. It was the end of 2014 and he came up with the idea. It was very much his idea and we sort of brainstormed like, and, but he did a lot of the initial work to like set it up. And I just kind of like, I was the only guy who sort of came along with him and said, yeah, this is a really great idea. And so I helped him in those early days. And then after about a year, I mean, he had certain other commitments, but um, it was definitely me and him for like most of the first few years and then, but like nowadays we have several contributors to join market. So it's a bit more of a mixed Maybe bag. Maybe you can explain to the yeah. what it is. <laughs> what it is the difference between the other yeah, yeah, exactly. and, uh... yeah, so I guess we should start with CoinJoin, right? Yeah, so course. CoinJoin um, is an idea that I guess Greg Maxwell was the first to propose back in 2013. And the simple idea is to say, well, the a Bitcoin transaction has inputs and it has outputs. And while usually the inputs are all provided by one person, one person is spending money, they would gather some inputs in order to spend them and then get change. 
uh, it's certainly, while that's the normal situation, it's certainly possible for multiple people, so in the simplest case, two people, to provide their inputs separately to the same transaction. So the transaction appears on the blockchain as one transaction, <clears throat> but it has two inputs and the inputs are signed by different people. So different people are providing money as input, and then the outputs are just as they are with an ordinary transaction. They can be to anyone. They can be to three different people, 10 different people. Okay, so that's the basic concept of CoinJoin. And what, what makes it very useful as an idea is that you have this all or nothing. Like if I sign my input, but you don't sign your input, then the transaction is not valid and it won't go through. Uh, but if we both sign our inputs, then we both know that the transaction will go through. So it's all or nothing. So either both of our money gets spent or none of our money gets spent. So it has a very simple kind of security model from that point of view. And it's for that reason, I think, that CoinJoin was the first privacy kind of protocol that got implemented in Bitcoin. And there were uh, implementations, one called Shared Coin by the blockchain.info guys, and one called Dark Wallet by Amir Taki and his friends um, around 2013. I think Shared, Shared Coin was even earlier, maybe, um, around that time. I'm not sure. But then we sort of developed the Join Market as a way of adding one extra little bit of thing to the mix, which was to say, well, what if, um, if I want to do a coin join for 1.243 Bitcoin, well, you don't really want to do that because you haven't got that exact amount, right? And you don't want to, more, more importantly, you don't want to spend that exact amount. And so the idea with coin join as a privacy protocol is that uh, if our outputs are different amounts, it's not really doing very much. Our idea here is to have your output and my output amount be exactly equal. If they're exactly equal, of course, they're different addresses. It means that nobody can tell which input, I mean, depending on details, but this is a kind of fundamental point. If they're exactly equivalent, then nothing else can help distinguish between them, right? So, but the problem with that is that means that the output amounts specifically have to be exactly the same. And there aren't realistic situations in the world, at least not often, where we both want to spend the exact same amount of money. So the idea of join market that Chris Belcher had was specifically that, oh, well, to solve that coordination problem, you want to use a market. And the way you would use a market is you would say, I want to spend 1.234 Bitcoins. You don't. But that just means I have to pay you a fee in order for you to spend 1.234 Bitcoins in an arbitrary way or an artificial way. So probably you're going to spend it back to your own wallet. But just the fact that you're spending exactly the same amount of money that I want to spend means that we can't distinguish between the two outputs. Even though their addresses are different, their amounts are the same. So that's the concept behind join market. And obviously there's a ton to say about how, how would you design such a system? How, how could it work? And um, I could go on about that for a long time, but we, we worked on it quite a lot for the first few years and it's, it developed a certain, obviously it's not a huge user base, but it has a certain user base of people who like uh, using that model because some of them just like the idea, well, they'll just switch on join market on their Linux laptop or their Bitcoin node or whatever. And they just leave it on and it doesn't really do anything. It's just every now and again, it will receive a message that says, do you want to do a coin join? I'll pay you a thousand sacks or whatever it is. And this is yes. And it does the coin join and the, the money just stays in the wallet and you, you just earned a small amount of Satoshis. Now, to be fair, and the person who's passive like that, who's sitting back and waiting, they do get other advantages because they also get a coin join and they might find that the, they're getting some privacy from, from doing those multiple coin joins. So I think it's principally for that reason that the amount of fees you get as a join market, um, we call them a, a yield generator or a maker, the amount of fees you get is going to be pretty small. But um, Which is the issue of the incentive to get enough yeah. liquidity to have the... Yeah, the, I mean, do, do, is that a problem or not? I and mean, I think that's why you have a market. The market figures it out. If the market decides that the fees should be low, because actually that person is receiving other benefits. As we said, they're, they're also getting coin joins. But there's a lot of little details to think about. Because like, for example, in this model, the way we designed it, which you know you could argue maybe you should design it differently, but the way we designed it was that the taker would just take all the inputs from all the makers and just like construct the transaction themselves. So if you ask, oh, what's the point of centralization in join market? Is it decentralized or is it centralized? The answer is it's decentralized in one way, but it's the, the, the point of centralization is dynamic. It's the specific person we call the taker who decides today, right now, I want to do a coin join and I'm going to pay for it. And effectively what they do is they pay all the network fees. So even if it's a big transaction, they could be quite, paying quite a large network fee and they pay small fees to all the makers as well to incentivize them to help them out. So they get, all, they get the best possible privacy model in the system. They get to choose when to do the transaction. They get to choose the amount. 
and they get to choose even like the number of counterparties and they can choose which specific counterparty. So they get every element of choice for the, for the, for the as, a, as a sort of counterpart to the fact that they have to pay all the fees. They have to eventually pay for it, right? So I think that model is kind of simple to understand. Um, but what then happened is, a I don't actually know the years of this, probably like 2017, I seem to remember, uh, Wasabi was announced maybe around then. Yeah, a bit before that. Was... <clears throat> well, I mean, because 2017, the, it was in Paris, in fact, the Breaking Bitcoin conference. Yeah, exactly. Breaking... yeah the Ke Kevin's conference. But uh, anyway, I, I don't want to quote dates because I'm going to get them wrong. But Wasabi and Samurai, I don't even know which one of them was first, but around that time period, we got these two other ideas. And, and the basic idea here is, is quite radically different. It's, it's, even though it's still coin joined, so you've still got outputs that are equal in a, in a, in a transaction. And, and inputs from more than one person, more importantly. Mm -hmm. um, but radically different design. And the, the concept here is, yeah, there is a central point of, there is a central server. And that server is telling clients, look, come join a coin join round, right? But you might initially think, well, that's terrible because then the coin join server will know all of the inputs and all of the outputs. So if that's like the NSA or something, then they just know everything, right? So that's true, of course, but that's where cryptography comes in. So in their design, what they have is, and again, this was actually written about by Greg Maxwell at the same <laughs> time as, as the original CoinJoin post, the idea of a Chalmian server. So Chalmian blinding here is that you can use cryptography to make sure that even though you don't know which input corresponds to which output, or which person as, as like matching the input and the output, even though you don't know that, nevertheless, you have a cryptographic guarantee that it's one of the people who produce the inputs is actually requesting the output. And so, and, and that's using what's called blinding. You know, just crudely imagine a number and then you just add another number so you can't see which number the original one, one was or something like that. <laughs> anyway, so Chalmian and blinding is a very clever idea. And, and that means that, yeah, there might, you can definitely argue there are some limitations with having one central server, but the main limitation it might have has been removed. The main limitation being it would see what all the linkages are between the inputs and the outputs. And another thing I think I really want to mention to people who are new, to, if anybody here is relatively new to all this stuff, is you might think, oh, this all sounds dubious, like criminals, you know, uh, we're trying to like hide where the money is going. And everyone has this concept of money laundering nowadays, which, by the way, nobody talked about when I was young. But uh, <laughs> um, well, I would like to point out that it isn't really about criminals, right? When people like me have spent you know, years working on this stuff, what we're trying to do is we're trying to put you in a position as a user of Bitcoin where you feel at least somewhat similar to how you feel when you use cash. And <clears throat> what that means is it, it helps your security. And now you, you might even think that cash is kind of dubious. Oh, I, I don't want to be, cash is kind of dirty, right? But no, you shouldn't think like that because a person's security depends sometimes on other people not knowing things about them. I mean, you don't have security cameras in your, in your bedroom that the police can look at. You don't have, you're not being watched all the time. And while that does theoretically make crime easier, right? It does, right? It makes it more easy for you to commit a crime because you're not being watched 100% of the time. On the other hand, if a bad guy gets access to those cameras, he's going to know everything about your life. He's going to know where you store your, your wallet. He's going to know when you're out of the house, right? So even if, it's, even if the good guys are the ones who, or you think they're the good guys, who have access to this private information about you. I mean, a, a good example of that is a bank might know a lot of private information about your finances. And you might think, well, the banks are not criminals. But what if that criminal hacks your bank, right? So, so the point is that there is an element of your personal security being dependent on your privacy. And look, I'm certainly not going to claim you're going to get perf perfect privacy from any of these tools. But any of these tools could at least help you as an ordinary person to feel like things are not quite that bad. Like if I'm not targeted by some really powerful entity, an or like a casual, I mean, the, the classic example I always give is, you know, you go into a bar and you pay for a beer with Bitcoin. You, if, if they can see your change address and see you have like a thousand Bitcoins in the change, well, they might, who knows, they might know that their friend might be a criminal and say, oh, look at that. And then you, he comes to your house with a, with a hammer or something. So it's just, it's just like avoiding the situation where you're just trivially giving away all of your financial information to people around you. And that's for your security. And it doesn't mean there's anything criminal about doing that. Yeah, no, definitely. We, in, in, uh, mm. we talk so much about privacy and human yeah. rights. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. It's literally like your security because yeah. if people know how much you have, it becomes a danger for you. Yeah. And even though yeah. you could secure yourself with like a strong multi-sig and even every tense, 
at the end of the day, mm. it's at the security and privacy. It's at the privacy level that you can get a strong security uh, yep. in such an easier way, and uh, you're gonna sleep better. That's why we really uh, have a lot of resources on privacy. Yeah. Speaking of privacy, then what mm. would be your take on the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem as of right now? So was through implementation, was there some way to market? Do you feel we are doing enough? What would you the next step of Bitcoin privacy uh, moving forward? And uh, with like all the analytics tools coming up with million right. and million of dollars, right. uh, all the KYC coming up, mm -hmm. all the exchange you know, giving their information yeah. to uh, Figma or TrackFund. Uh, where do you see like the world of Bitcoin is going and what we would we want to emphasize Bitcoin community should move uh, towards? Yeah, so it's a very, I think it's a very difficult question um, in right. terms of like, yeah, in terms of like, you know, trying to give us a score where we are right now, yeah. you know, I, I think it's not very good, but I mean, I think that's a function of Bitcoin how Bitcoin good. is, you know, and I, and I think then the, the natural reaction that a lot of people have is, well, Bitcoin's bad, wrongly designed, right? And I just think it's, the question is a little deeper than that. Because uh, the, the, the classic argument of people who advocate for, let's say, Monero or Zcash yeah. is always that you can't b build privacy as a, as a layer on top of a non-private system. And I think that's, that's actually not really correct in a similar way to how um, TLS or SSL, or the, the, the secure layer of the Internet, is actually built on top of a completely public layer. Um, and also there are other factors to do with the fact that it's a consensus system. A lot of analogies, I love drawing analogies, like, oh, it's like Linux, it's like the internet, it's like this. But actually they all fall down somewhere because our system here in Bitcoin is so weird and unusual. It's, it's a system where everyone has to be in lockstep at every moment. Um, so Bitcoin itself, I think it's just another if, uh, a side effect of, of the same basic core concept that what Bitcoin really is by nature is not a transactional currency. It's more of a settlement system. And transactional currency is something that has to be built on top of it. So if we look at the comparison of lightning payments with Bitcoin payments, we see this very clearly. If I have a lightning wallet and everything is working well, I'm going to have a situation where I've got a balance. I don't have to think about multiple UTXOs, which is no user is ever going to understand. No ordinary user is ever going to want to understand how that works. It's a mess. If you've ever written a Bitcoin wallet, you will understand. It is an absolute mess trying to figure out how to select UTXOs and then use them. As a user uh, experience. It's, it's appalling, yeah. And then the second obvious one is the time. Uh, if I go into a, a shop and I buy something, and I literally had an experience recently where I paid for something, it was actually quite a high value thing. That's why it had to be on chain. And I literally had to wait there for an hour. Uh, and that's something we cannot do as a, as a user experience. Then there's maybe even worse than that is the fees. <clears throat> the fees are not only high often, but much worse than that. They're volatile and you can't predict them. I have had many experiences and I consider myself relatively expert in Bitcoin, but I had many experiences of paying for something thinking I'd chosen a sensible fee and then I had to wait a day because suddenly the mempool or my mempool or the mempool, whatever, <laughs> just suddenly exploded and then suddenly all the, the transactions after me were getting in ahead of me because they had a higher fee, so I had to wait. So all of these things, these are just the trivial things. And then the fourth one is exactly what we're talking about, privacy. By default, if you just take normal steps and normal measures with a normal Bitcoin wallet, especially on your phone, the privacy of those um, transactions is very, very bad indeed you have to jump through a lot of hoops. And I'm not saying you shouldn't jump through them, especially for the more important transactions, you know. Um, but uh, it costs you money, uh, it costs you time, and it costs a lot of thinking about how to set up these kind of privacy features like CoinJoin on, on the blockchain. So the more we think about this, um, the more you realize that you do kind of want the transactional aspect of Bitcoin to occur more on secondary layers. Of course, you can still make a counter argument and say, hmm, but what about the guys who are spending like $500 million on chain or even if just like a million or something, some very high number, they can't use second layers because the security model is not appropriate. So how, are, how is their uh, privacy to be dealt with? And I think that's, that's an open question to me that I'm not really sure about the answer to. I mean, things like CoinJoin help. One of the reasons I did continue to work on CoinJoin for several years and not just say, oh, this is old tech, is because I, I kind of think it will always have a certain place because even if that's only a backbone settlement layer, there'll still be issues around the privacy of that backbone settlement layer. I don't know how it's going to get resolved, but CoinJoin might continue to be part of the story. CoinSwap as well as a kind of a, arguably a more advanced variant of the same kind of idea. And I think, I think you're right. And we need to different, differentiate the, the, 
privacy solution based on the need and the user. Yeah. Someone that has a lot of money yeah. may be willing to pay to get that extra privacy and right. use more difficult tools and more take more time tools, to yeah. get the privacy to a certain level where he can actually spend because it's not something that you use on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Well, a basic user should be privacy by default and Lightning can yeah. offer that solution in a such a, a, an easier way yeah. so the customer, like the, the new person that doesn't understand how it works and he should and at some point you know, yeah. use Lightning by using exactly. Lightning or whatever solution we have above it yeah, yeah. Uh, should exactly. be priced by default. And there's actually that argument that Bitcoin is a settlement layer and that Lightning is a payment layer and then yeah. you can have a privacy layer on top of Lightning using the advantage that is given. Uh, so it's the opposite of, of what, like you said, the cash and Monero are yeah. into, but it, it would make sense and then I mean, to be fair to them, they have good academic arguments for why they, they think like that. I mean, there's, there's you know, things like CoinJoin. I'd, I've seen academics make arguments, and I think they're absolutely correct, that at a fundamental level, that kind of system can't work. It can't work in the sense that it can't give you guarantees. Yeah, it can give you practical effects, but it can't give you guarantees. So that's why I say to people, you know, you use CoinJoin, but, but like the way I used CoinJoin for, for years is just like, you know, I'm doing a payment, why not just make it a coin join? It's not going to actually completely make me private, but it's actually just going to add to that. It's going to make everything about the transaction graph more difficult for the analysts. And there are people out there, as you've just mentioned, being paid millions of dollars to analyze everything going on on the Bitcoin blockchain. Let's make their job as hard as possible. Yeah, because they're, they're not doing a good thing, in my opinion. They're doing a very bad thing. Um, and uh, we are actively all fighting for it because uh, the yeah. implementation are being implemented in wallets, in a POS solution, merchant solution. And uh, but we're definitely getting more intense on it. Yeah, and what we could do is like go into the obvious statements about what people can and should do to make their privacy situation better, because it isn't just about CoinJoin, right? No, I mean, you start with you know, you start with things like if you run your own Bitcoin node, you've improved your privacy significantly in terms of um, in terms of like when you're querying a balance, you're just looking at things on your own blockchain instead of looking at someone else's blockchain, an Electrum server, uh, some external block explorer, or whatever it is. So running your own Bitcoin node, broadcasting your transactions through that node, again, is the best model of privacy because the whole thing about Bitcoin nodes is they're broadcasting transactions all the time. And actually, so just make sure you guys, <clears throat> yeah. it's not because you run an umbrella net, in an umbral net node that you're actually using it. You need to actually connect your wallet to the node. Because yeah. uh, a lot of people <laughs> just run around right. and don't use it. Uh, you need actually to put like some economical value within that node uh, by using it with your wallet. Yeah, using it with your wallet and querying via it rather than via a third party. And uh, so this is like that. And then there's obvious ones like not reusing addresses, which is kind of default on pretty much every wallet yeah. you'll use. But, you know, you might, there are situations where it's kind of tempting to do that, but try to avoid it. Um, and then there's things like, and this is the more, when we get out of the technology stuff and we start thinking about the real world, the problem is exchanges, right? I mean, we've all been there. I mean, almost all of us have been there where we've tried to, we want to buy Bitcoin, we want to get some Bitcoin. And the, by far the easiest way would be to sign up to a Coinbase, a Kraken, or whatever it is. And while some of these people are actually trying hard to do the right thing, you know, I think, for example, Kraken is a very responsible organization. It ultimately doesn't matter because they 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 have to do what regulators, especially U.S. regulators, but also like EU regulators, tell them. And increasingly, as the years go by, what they get told to do is is worse and worse, and they're collecting more and more private information about more and more people. And that, in a sense, is the biggest reason why this whole, we talked about chain analysis, why it's so dangerous, is because they're, they're collaborating with those guys. So those guys, so the, the, the problem is you've got all these addresses on the blockchain. And in principle, who knows who it is, right? But if all of these exchanges have got your addresses the way you made your deposits, your original deposits, then they can attach names to addresses. And from there, they can start building graphs and finding connections between people. And yet, Technically, they're right. It does help them catch criminals, but unfortunately, it also helps them catch everyone, right? Which we don't want. We want we don't want them to know everything about our private details. Yeah, um, so KYC. Yeah. yeah, the solution to go for non KYC. Uh, right. Risk is the obvious one. You can also mm -hmm. exchange with like ATM, with scalping mm -hmm. people. You can work to actually earn Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. getting paid to get your Bitcoin, so you don't have an ID. Uh, there's a lot of new startups standing up, like uh, lmp 2 p Bot, RoboSat, Peach Wallet. Uh, so yeah. the solution are here, the UX is getting better for a more friendly uh, mass adoption of non-KYC solution. So it's really up to you to just like stop using KYC solutions. Yeah. And another piece of practical advice maybe is uh, partitioning. So, you know, you have different things you do in your life. You might have work stuff and then you might have, I don't know, hobby stuff. 
maybe for most people this doesn't really apply because like Bitcoin is just this little part of your life and like then there's all the rest of the stuff. But partitioning can mean actually having separate wallets for separate things. It's got, I mean, a simplest way to understand that might be there's the, there's the cold wallet with your savings and then there's the hot wallet on your phone with, you know, $200 or whatever it is you put on there. And you have a di very different security model for those two wallets. And you also think carefully when you move funds from one to the other. So that kind of transaction is kind of different from the other kind of transaction where you've got the 200 on the wallet, you pay for a beer, then you pay for your friend, uh, friend for dinner, and you don't really care so much about it. It's small amounts of money, it's not, and if it's, if it's, for example, you might not do this, but you might use CoinJoin to move funds between the cold wallet and then into the, uh, into the hot wallet. And so there's some kind of breakage. Try to create some kind of breakage between different partitioning, different parts of your, your Bitcoin usage if you can. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely, and uh, just be aware that um, a tricky thing with Bitcoin is that mm. if you do it wrong, it can cost a, mm. a, a lot. So, mm. uh, because then if, if at some point you connect a non KYC address with a KYC address, then you could consider that you have compromised your whole security setup and then you yeah. need to start again. So it's a, yeah. do well at, and also consider that at some point the government may ask for like your, your XPUB directly. So you should really not try to, to do a different address for your non KYC coin, but really like separate them at the root of uh, the seed uh, yeah. of the mnemonic phrase and really have two different things that you sign in a different place and um, I think it has two different accounts like a bank account and another bank account um, to mm -hmm. say so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good one, yeah. Um, we're actually here uh, in El Salvador. <laughs> we are. How, how do you feel uh, is the adoption here? Uh, um, so yes, yeah, so I've been living here for about seven or eight months now. Um, I visited before that but uh, I would say, I mean, it's what you'd expect if just by common sense, which is to say there isn't much adoption. I mean, after all, this is a poor country. Most people don't spend all day like messing around with Bitcoin nodes, right? Uh, and also, just as relevant to that is um, if you offer to pay someone in Bitcoin. I mean, I have p positive stories. I have, for example, a certain professional people I am paying regularly in Bitcoin. But the average guy on the street, if you're doing, a, if he's doing a job for you, he's going to want to get paid in dollars. And it's not just because he hates Bitcoin. He might hate Bitcoin or he might love it. But the thing is, if he's getting paid for work, he might use all of that money to pay for his food that week. And so Bitcoin being volatile as a, as a, as a what is it, a, a unit of account, let's say, or a store of value, being volatile, it's not appropriate for people who are um, living like near the poverty line to actually use it as a, as a, well, they don't really have savings. That's the whole point, right? Um, that doesn't mean you, you can't use it at all in everyday life. I mean, there's the whole experiment in Bitcoin Beach, which has obviously been a big success, where there are people like, you know, vent, street vendors and so on actually accepting Bitcoin. You don't see that much here, but you can spend it in many different shops. And um, as I said, I, the professional people offering services, I mean, Everyone's different. Some people don't like it. Other people do like it. I mean, sometimes a taxi driver will be, hey, Bitcoin, and they'll want to take a tip in Bitcoin, and it just varies. Oh, yeah, I do agree. Um, when you look at the headline, it's either there's a lot of adoption or not. Mm. The reality is more like in between, and it's going to take a lot of time to actually get that. Yeah. And the education is key. May I, may I ask, why did you decide to move to El Salvador? Yeah, I mean, it's a combination of reasons, but I mean, the simplest reason is it's Bitcoin. Bitcoin yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, the core reason is Bitcoin, which is to say that... Um, I feel like in countries like the UK, where I come from, it's increasingly like you feel under pressure that if you're a Bitcoiner, you're somehow, you know, it's, it's, it's criminal, it's dirty, like I'm trying to interact with the banks. And I had such, I mean, I don't want to tell you my full life story, but I had a lot of troubles trying to get, move money through banks because they just don't want to deal with Bitcoin. I mean, some, some cases they're very explicit, like HSBC says, we will not deal with any like transfer to or from an exchange. We will not deal with anything connected with cryptocurrency. Other times they just don't just, they don't tell you, but I've heard friends that they had accounts closed and stuff. And, uh, you know, so, and then there, of course there are meetups and I even organized a meetup myself last year in, in, in London that was, that was a lot of fun and met a lot of interesting people. But the scene is relatively small compared to how much of a big international city it is. And I feel like here, I mean, I have more Bitcoin friends here in this very small city of San Salvador than I ever had in London. Um, so there's a kind of a, there's a living culture here. There's people going to meetups all the time and stuff. And, uh, you know, events exactly like the one we're at right now are a perfect example of why El Salvador is a much better place for me to live in that sense. Yeah, true. So actually right now we are at like Cuba Plus, which is an initiative by uh, Forgo and the Bitcoin office to train the next generation of Lightning Dev. And so it's like a two week intense course program on site. And before that, the students had some online classes. 
Uh, you gave a couple of co classes. How how was the feeling with the students? How do you feel about the education here in Salvador and like forming the next generation? Well, I mean, this is pretty much the dream for me of what we should be doing, uh, which is to say that there's there's kind of two angles we're pushing at it from. There's the Mi Premier Bitcoin angle, which is like let's go to the grassroots. Let's go to and I think you're involved in something similar, where you go to local schools, right? or you go to small local communities and you just do something like you teach them how to use a wallet. And because obviously at the base level, people here, like most places in the world, just don't know that even the very basics of Bitcoin of, of how to like operate a wallet and what's actually going on. On the, on the other sort of higher end, which is what we're doing here is, well, let's talk to people who are, you know, high level students. They're maybe just about to start their careers. So they have a good solid founding of education and they could be Bitcoin engineers. They could be lightning engineers. Um, or they could just be working in the industry. And so let's infuse them and give them like a real like deep understanding of everything they need to know to be really high quality engineers in this field. Uh, I think that's badly needed here because if, if, if El Salvador is to succeed as an experiment, I mean, yeah, sure, you've got Bukele and he's, the, the, he's doing all these initiatives and he's trying his best, but he needs, he need, you know, the, the country needs its, its young people to actually get involved, uh, whether it be at an industrial level or even like a, a theoretical level or a protocol engineer level, so that there's some kind of actually connection to Bitcoin and, and, and the whole community and not, it's not just some weird side experiment. It needs to be, so I know, I mean, I'm saying it in various ways, but basically I think it's a great idea to have this kind of education program. No, no, yeah, I agree. And uh, like you said, the Salvador and its Bitcoin adoption is definitely not one. It's uh, something that will take a lot of time. And yeah. If us Bitcoiners don't make the effort to actually go there and try to help, yeah. uh, it's not going to happen because it's already like crazy that the government <laughs> allow us to basically create it and, and do it. So It's great, yeah. yeah. It's funny, like, so you go from experiments to experiment. Bitcoin was an experiment when you got it, and now mm. you're trying like a new experiment with uh, getting a country to adopt it. Yeah, I mean, to be, I mean, I, I, it's not, it's not like, oh, I'm being such a saint, and I'm, because honestly, I'm, I, I'm coming here, and it's just a nice place to live. I mean, the warm weather and stuff, and, and it's cheap cost of living as well. So there's, there's, there's advantages to living here, but those things I could have found in several other countries. But what made this different, of course, is the whole Bitcoin experiment. And I'm, by, by coming here, I'm not saying, hey, look, this is definitely a massive success. I'm saying. Yeah, it's still an experiment. I mean, we, as, you, as you correctly point out, it, it, all, this whole thing was an experiment from the start. So let's see what we can do. I mean, it's been, I think it's been a kind of an ex successful experiment so far. I mean, not perfectly, I and mean, the whole world isn't using Bitcoin, but I mean, but that's a kind of interesting point, isn't it? Like a lot of people have this, I think a lot of people have this binary mode of thinking where, oh, it's either succeeded or it hasn't. And I've always thought that, to use one of those terrible analogies I mentioned earlier, Linux, you know, is Linux, Linux a success? And I think it's a massive success if you look at it in the right way, right? But Which is to say, reserve, okay, yeah. people in the street are not talking about Linux every day. They're not, a lot of people in their homes are not using Linux, but everything around us is using Linux. And so it might be, I wouldn't be surprised, that's what happens with Bitcoin. That's mm. true. Also, they do that sentence, like to say, we often uh, overestimate what we can do in two years ah, and yeah. under in 10. Mm. Uh, and I think Bitcoin is exactly that. Uh, in mm -hmm. 10 years, like, it's what, it's 14 years now? I think it's 14, uh, yeah, that sounds right, yeah, 14. Look where we are. And so mm. obviously Salvador is like three years, but like in 10 years, if Cuba Plus or if, if everything, this experience work, uh, the amount of Bitcoin engineers that could come out, the, the amount of people mm. that could use it the right way, uh, could truly really show an example for other country to follow. And I really think like Bukele did a leap of faith at the end of yeah, the day. That's right. And all the other countries are like backing off and not <laughs> jumping. They're like watching him go to the cliff and like, is he going to fly or is he going to crash? I guess that's a, that's a pretty good, <laughs> and, uh, pretty dramatic, but yeah, that is pretty And then if he flies, they're going to be all right, well, we can jump and maybe the Bitcoiners are going to help us too. And if yeah. we have a, a roadmap to follow. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting question is how much do they need our help, you know? Because a lot of people come here and they're like me and they want to help. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's very positive. But we think we should be cautious not to underestimate the people themselves, right? I mean, uh, what, what they can do themselves. I mean, what Bukele did himself is something that nobody else even thought of, I mean, let alone actually do. So, and, you know, I, I give all credit to the people here that um, I find their attitude is very positive generally. Uh, people here can not as cynical as people back home. Um, so that's all good. I do think what they are missing though is that technical background, which is why I think this kind of program is so useful. That is what I've noticed because I've met, like I was mentioning professional people that I pay in Bitcoin. So they, ha they have some enthusiasm, 
But even those like professional level people, a lot of them, they just don't know any basics about Bitcoin, like really how it works. And it's, it's quite striking. We need that technical knowledge to be raised, I think. Right, definitely. And it's going to take some time because yeah. you cannot form engineers in, in a year. Like, yeah, it's a whole process. And um, for some of the big people like from before that understand mathematics and go to university and get yeah. access to like, higher education and then they can be found on Bitcoin uh, to get a job in, uh, in companies. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's gonna be so. <laughs> it's a it's a whole new uh, path for your life that you you decided to to set up. Yeah, it's great. I'm enjoying it so far. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Adam, thank you uh, so much for your time. Do you have thank a you. last word for the Bitcoin community, and maybe worldwide? Because I guess it's, it's not that well the Salvadorian one. I don't know. keep keep learning. You know, this isn't just about money. It's about a whole kind of movement of how public key cryptography and you know the whole cypherpunk ethos is changing the world and i, I think uh, there's a lot to be enthusiastic about yeah. definitely where do people can find you maybe you um pfft, i mean I, I don't use twitter i have a github is adam i s z or z um you can maybe and i have a i also have a website and a blog it's like ray if i r e r e y i f y dot com slash blog and most of that stuff is about cryptography, but it's like Bitcoin related stuff. So if you're interested in cryptography, you might find that interesting. Yeah. Also, we've recorded the lectures you've done. Right. So it's going to be on either the Sovereign University YouTube channel or Google Plus channel. We're not sure how we're going to manage both projects. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you like it. Don't forget to comment, subscribe, like. And if you have any questions for Adam, put it in the description and maybe one day he will respond. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.